Hi everyone, my name is Barry West. I'm Head of Emerging Technology within the Regulator at ADGM, and I would like to welcome you all to this panel session where we will be looking at the good, the bad, and the reality of fintech adoption within financial services. And I'm really pleased to be joined by Anastasia and Gabrielle, who will be sharing their insights and war stories around the various aspects of collaboration between FIs and fintechs. But before we kick off, perhaps I can, both, uh, I can ask both of you to give a quick intro. Uh, and Anastasia, do you mind doing the honours and going first, please? Hi, Barry. It's good. Great to be here today. Uh, my name is Anastasia. I'm head of partnerships at Closematch. Closematch is a regulatory technology company out of London, but we also operate in North America and Asia. And my background has always been in regulatory compliance and regulatory technology and data and technology. So I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. And Gabrielle, please. Sure. I'm really thrilled to be here with you guys. So, hey, Barry. Hi, Anastasia. I feel I'm the little odd one out here because I'm not as rec tech focused as you guys, but um, do my best to give you a little bit of a background. So my name is Gabrielle Zarillo. I'm the director of fintech for the MIA region at Plug and Play. So Plug and Play is a California based early stage venture capital fund and a non equity taking innovation platform that essentially connects startups with about 450 large corporations and entities and regulators across the world. Um, I oversee our local uh, offices in a number of different regions in EMEA and cities. So Amsterdam, Barcelona, Paris, Frankfurt, and Abu Dhabi, of course. And before that, I was doing fintech initiatives at Citibank. And prior to that, doing similar at Bloomberg. So a little bit of the VC aspect and a little bit of the implementation side on the corporate side that I hope I'll be able to share with you guys. Perfect. Thank you so much, both. Um, and this is going to be a very interesting conversation with the two different uh, kind of views and uh, aspects. So, so with that in mind, um, uh, I just want to set the scene um, for those that are listening in and, and through our own work as a regulator with DGM and working with fintech, we've seen the same issues uh, that hamper the adoption of fintech and regtech bubble up time and time again, things such as lengthy procurement processes, complex integration issues, and of course, uh, the uncertainty of the regulator's position on certain technology and, and, and the firms adopting that. And so it's our hope that by enabling regulators, FIs and fintechs to rapidly experiment and prototype together, the digital lab, the ADGM digital lab will help ease some of these issues, um, if not solve for some of them. So with that in mind, again, I would really love to hear from you both uh, on what typical client engagements are like for you. Obviously, Anastasia coming from the point of view of the, the reg tech and fintech aspects. Um, and maybe Anastasia, I can ask you to go first again. Uh, and I'd love to know um, the kind of, like I say, the typical engagements. And, and also if you can share um, what type of things work really well for you. Sure, absolutely. So a typical engagement for close match, uh, or just generally what I see from a reg tech and fintech firms, working with large financial institutions is is very lengthy uh, process, if I could say the least. Uh, um, we are seeing um, anywhere from 12 to 18 months uh, sales cycles and the engagement and the conversations are continuously ongoing. So it starts usually with an idea and something that an organization and a bank wants to fix. Uh, they probably have done quite a lot of understanding the challenge that they're trying to address and have really looked at um, and in a way, already have an idea how they want to approach it or uh, go about it. So for us, this is when we typically start having a conversation, that, trying to understand what is the ideal uh, success criteria, what is the challenge and problems organization are trying to fix, and are we actually the right organization to help them fix it. Um, because it's so lengthy, because it's so complex, there's quite a lot of people involved, lots of departments that get involved, lots of ideas. Sometimes that uh, helps to have lots of creative ideas coming together. Sometimes it's a distraction because way too many ideas uh, yeah. sometimes do not allow to uh, resolve or to come to a, a good way forward, um, uh, you know, having a decision. Um, so what really works well, I find uh, in all of those complex 
processes is where there is a, a stakeholder and an individual who is with subject matter expertise, but also the weight and the, the power and authority to make decisions who is involved and who is very highly organized in driving this initiative forward. Somebody who's put a goal and an objective and is very much working towards that goal and being able to work mutually um, mutually at the beginning to really um, organize this process agree that process perhaps document that process agree on the success criteria and mutually work towards it this is what really really works well um, otherwise it goes a little bit chaos at times and sometimes Peace gets lost, and sometimes those 18 months do and no conclusion, no resolution, and sometimes they extend to another 18 months. <laughs> and, and that's that's really fascinating. There's many questions I want to ask about that, but, but maybe just uh, the, the last piece um, we can pick up again. So when do you get that uh-oh moment? How, how do you when do you know that it's gonna then go into the next kind of 18 months? You've lost the right business person, for example, and, and those kind of things. What how, when do you get that? How often does that happen? I would say it's actually quite early on, um, but what really helps and what has been helping me uh, over the years is to be really honest with my first of all, working with those organizations, to really uh, be good at uh, challenging and asking questions to that partner on the other side, you know, the, 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 the leadership team running this project from the bank's perspective. Uh, sometimes, you know, up front being very honest with questions, being very uh, determined of making sure you ask the right questions and they are answering it the right way. So you'll, you'll actually hear it very often if they are realistic with themselves, if they actually have the, uh, the, the power or the decision making uh, to move things forward, if they actually understand exactly what the solution should look like. And by not asking those questions, we're fooling each other. And that's what really, that, that's what you, when you know that it's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> Wow, that's so cool. And yeah, it's, it's so interesting. And that feels like a really hard earned uh, piece of wisdom almost. Uh, and, you know, I can imagine for fledgling startups that that kind of conversation possibly wouldn't be something they'd be willing to have. Um, is that something you find you've kind of established yourself a bit more, you, you have a bit more, a bit more parity uh, when it comes to those kind of conversations? Absolutely. I, I think when I when I first started uh, and, and, and started working in this field, uh, a project is incredibly exciting. It's an opportunity to learn things, to develop things, to be creative. Uh, but a lot of times you naively or jump right into it. You spend all this time and all this effort and you really leave and breathe this project for a while. And then it's a huge disappointment to uh, not turn it from a project to a BAU uh, and actually go live, right? Um, so I guess going from that experience and have done it for several years now, uh, you know, getting to that stage where I still am extremely excited and can't wait to work on a new project, to do new research and development, to build a new product or new way of solving a, a problem. Is it, it, it exactly the same way? So uh, no more fooling myself, really, trying to really work on things that, that will make a difference. That's so cool. Thank you. And, and if I can just um, um, maybe move towards uh, asking Gabrielle a question now, um, and, and kind of being in an accelerator at Plug and Play, um, you're in a really interesting position. You get to see both sides of this story play out. Um, and so I'd love to know what are the types of issues that you see when you're observing this interaction? Uh, and again, I'd love any insights that you can share as well around this. No, no, sure thing. Thank you so much. Um, I just first want to say that Anastasia, you are being so hard on yourself by claiming that you are at any point naive or fooling yourself because 
myself, just like you and Barry, we've been doing this for years now. And it isn't a question that, oh, you know, we have to find that holy grail of a person within an organization that under, that's a subject matter expert and that has the capability of actually signing off on this. It's that for years and years and years, those people didn't exist, right? So you had to, you know, go in there and you had to believe and you had to try your hardest. And then you'd have to find someone who was willing to champion you within the bank and then who might potentially have had the ear of someone who had the budget and willing to explain why it was important to, you know, partner with you guys. So it was never, ever an, a question of naivety. And, you know, it's just that those roles are only starting to actually happen within banks now. And now you have and now we as an industry actually have a, the luxury of being able to say, hey, that's what we require of you as in financial institutions that we couldn't before back in the day, right? Um, but no, going back to this whole, you know, what we see on the financial institution side, but also on the startup side is that simply the organizations weren't structured in order to test these solutions appropriately. And it isn't from, you know, lack of wanting to, it isn't from lack of insights or lack of even vision. I think a lot of wonderful people in banking have tremendous vision and tremendous, you know, energy that they'd like to input into making their, this industry better. However, it was just very, very hard to structure out. So as you know, financial institutions in general are just very siloed out organizations. And if the innovation process is not a siloed out process, it's a very holistic process that requires a lot of participants to come in and chime in. And so what we found that was very interesting, and I, we started doing at plug and play a couple of years, no, maybe three years back now, was to actually um, help out a lot of the innovation people or the champions or the sponsors to help in a way educate certain departments that we traditionally see as blockers. And I say traditionally, because I don't think they're blockers at all, um, procurement departments, legal teams are not out there to get you. Um, it's possible IT is, but that's just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but procurement and legal, I can assure you, they're not actually out there to get you. They're full of wonderful, you know, men and women that are looking on how to best protect the bank, but also what's best for the entity. And so we start doing, for instance, these workshops to explain, okay, if you have a startup that only just started two, three years ago, or even one year ago, well, maybe they can't fill up that very, very long procurement questionnaire. Maybe they don't have three years of income statements and balance sheets to show you that they are a solid enterprise. But there are other ways of proving that they are, you know, very, very beneficial to the entity. And maybe we have to find ways, easier ways to get around that in order to trial the solutions, you know, ways that are safe for the institution and ways that are safe for uh, the startup as well, because we don't want to take advantage of young startups either. That's a reputational risk. And also as people, we don't, we don't really want to do that. And what's been also very, very exciting is that over time, um, Keep in mind that in fintech in particular and in reg tech, evidently, what we would find is that we were often towing this gray line of regulatory infrastructure that wouldn't account for these new solutions. So the banks were a little bit difficult in getting involved. Um, they felt unsure how much they could actually, you know, put in and how much they could really trial this. And fundamentally, what happened is because there's been such a an excitement and general push within regulatory labs and regulation in general to allow banks to trial these solutions. It's allowed for the startups, the banks, and just anyone in the ecosystem to really become more open to the innovation process. Did that answer the question? Much. It did. It's amazing. What a really amazing answer. And I wish we could uh, continue on and dive more and more into these aspects, but I'm told we've got like one minute left. So maybe very quickly in 10 seconds each, if you could, what would you change out of everything we've discussed? Uh, Anastasia. I need more than one minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I guess uh, just to kind of echo everything we talked about today, what I would change is uh, the or, big financial institutions uh, can definitely embrace FinTech and RegTech, but it's the people that are driving this organization that make the difference. And uh, the right people being involved in the right process and understanding how to work with fintechs, that's what makes a difference. So empower those people and give them the tools, teach them and uh, really kind of understand that a fintech and a startup is not the same thing as a scale up and is not the same thing as a mature technology organization that you are uh, bringing into the uh, company. 
So thank you, thank you, Anastasia. And Gabrielle, two seconds, sorry. I'm, I'm just gonna echo Anastasia uh, just on the talent side and say that actually, I think in the next few years, we're gonna see people that go into banking the same way they're starting to go into Google and you know Apple because it's gonna become much more tech driven. And I think that is gonna fundamentally just change you know, the way we interact with startups and fintechs and regtechs. Wow, that's really exciting. Thank you ever so much, both of you. Um, it's been really fascinating. And I think next time we'll schedule an hour long session and maybe we'll go for a drink sometime when we all can. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thanks very much for, for speaking. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.